Okay, I guess we can continue then. Um, so what Stefan told you so far is what GAMS can do for you uh, in terms of developing your models. Now, developing your models is typically only the first step in any uh, optimization project. The second one being the deployment of your models. And so, um, how this was done in the past is typically the OR expert is developing the model using GAMS. Then they uh, use some software engineering skills and build their user interface around that model. And then they roll that out to their end users. Um, the connection between the user interface and GAMS can be done by one of the various APIs that GAMS ships with. Um, and there are two important issues with this approach. The obvious one being that, well, developing a user interface uh, takes time. And also you need to have access to um, software engineering uh, resources. But the second issue here, and I want to emphasize that one, is that for a successful optimization project, it's typically not as straightforward as I described you developing the model, you building the user interface around it, and that's it. Typically, it's more, uh, it's more complex. What you would like to do is you would you make some assumptions while developing your models, which might be correct or might not be correct. Uh, and you also simplify the reality, which might be feasible or might not be feasible. And what, will you, what, you, what you would like to do is you would like to come up with a first prototype of your model, roll that out to the, the customers, give that prototype to the, to the customers or to your end users so that they can play around with it. And they can see some immediate, um, they can give you some immediate feedback, see some irregularities in the data and so forth. And then you go back to the drawing board and, and fix those issues. And so this is more like a circular uh, process. And then the time required to always go back and rebuild the user interface quickly becomes a big chunk of the work here. And we at GAMS believe that this should be the least amount of work. You should concentrate on developing the model and not on developing the user interface around your model. And so what we've come up with is a framework where we emphasize configuration instead of programming. Uh, I will explain that in more detail in the coming minutes. Um, and we call this framework GAMS Miro. So what is GAMS Miro? Well, it's an interactive uh, application for your GAMS models. Uh, it allows you to visualize the data. So we as humans tend to grasp data much more quickly by looking by, by visualizing it in the form of a map or a chart and so forth. Uh, and so Miro can do that for you. Uh, Miro also uh, handles your data, like you can store uh, what we call a scenario in the Miro internal database and you can, can compare that data set, that scenario with other scenarios, with other GAMS runs. Um, what GAMS Miro is also is a library where all your Miro applications are stored. So this is typically how your end users interact with your applications. So they have this library where there might be one or multiple apps in there. They launch those apps from there, there and then they start working with them. And last but not least, Miro is also the gateway for optimizing in the cloud. Now, Miro is entirely based on web technology, so you can either use it on your local machine, but you can also use it from within any modern web browser. And so this allows you to install Miro, not on a local machine, but on a server, and then collaborate with, with different people on, on, your, on your apps. And so to summarize, GAMS Miro is a deployment environment for your GAMS models. Now, before I go into the demo, because I really think that showing you what, what Miro is uh, in, in a demo is much more uh, uh, clear than, than with slides, I wanna emphasize one important aspect and that is how data flows between Miro 
the user interface and GAMS. And so the heart of the whole data exchange is what we call the GAMS Miro data contract. Now this data contract can be established right from inside your model. So you use um, GAMS dollar control options called dollar on external input and dollar of external input. And uh, if I can highlight that here. So here on external input and off external input and the same with the output. So on external output and off external output. And that's all you need to do. Like you need to tell Miro what data should be coming from Miro and be fed into the GAMS model and what data should be visualized back in Miro once your model finishes the salt. And so then when you have your, your, your Miro application, the data flow starts as follows. The user loads data into the interface. This data can come either from the Miro internal database or an external file. Once the so-called sandbox, so the Miro interface is populated with input data and you click on solve, Miro transfers this data to GAMS, GAMS reads this data, solves your model and returns the results back into the user interface. So this is the typical workflow, load data into the interface, run GAMS, and visualize the results. Now you can again save these results either in the Miro internal database in the form of a scenario, or you can export it um, to, X, to an external file again. All right, and to better grasp the idea here, I wanna uh, show you how this works in a live demo. Now I will bring up the, uh, I will bring up the GAMS Studio, the GAMS uh, integrated development environment again. And what you see here is already familiar to you. This is the transport model. And uh, I, can, I can run this here and see that I get the results that you've seen uh, before as well. Um, and now I wanna turn this into a Miro application. So what do I need to do? Well, I already told you about the most important part, which are these tags. So let's say I wanna uh, have all these symbols here as my input data. So uh, uh, in instead of having three models, I kind of modified this a little bit so that you can select the type of model. Uh, so this can be LP, MIP or min LP uh, and I, annotate my inputs by using these tags. So on external input, you can see that the syntax highlighter of studio already recognized that this is a valid dollar control option. And I do the same for the output. Let me make that a little bit uh, right. Cool. So this is all you need to do to tell Miro that this data should not come from, from these data statements here, but should rather come from Miro. Now let's go to the output section down here, where I already prepared uh, a, a, par a parameter, in this case, a table, um, which is the schedule that basically stores the result of my, of my, um, of my transportation uh, problem. And I again annotate these here by saying on external output, oops, on external output and off external output, right. So now I've established a data contract. I both told Miro about the inputs as well as the outputs that once the model is solved should be uh, read by Miro again. So I can run this again and uh, off external up. This should obviously off external input, not off external output, uh, small typo here. And I run this again 
And you can see that it runs just as before. Uh, the, the model itself didn't really change by that. It's just an annotation that is only used when you want to run Miro. Now, how do you run Miro? Well, you go to this Miro tab uh, up here and you say run base mode. So what's happening now is Miro is being launched. You can see all sorts of stuff is going on. Some data is being read already and my interface uh, is here. Now this interface currently has no data. So what I can do is I can say load data and you can see that already some data that was read from the model by GAMS automatically um, is here, is available here. And if I click on import, this data is loaded. Now I have it here. I have my, my scalars here, the type, which is an LP, the F, which is 90, the min S, which is 100 and so forth. I have some capacity, I have my demand, I have my distance matrix and so forth. So all this data comes from your model. So what was happening in the background here is that these data statements here were read by GAMS and GAMS automatically created this default scenario for you. Now let's go back to Miro here and let's go to the, um, to the output section here. And here you can see the symbols that I tagged with on external output of external output. So I have my shipment here and I have my output scalars. In this case, it's a single scalar. It's my total transportation cost. Um, and so that, that's, basic, that's the basic idea of Miro, right? You, you annotate your model, you, all you need to do afterwards is you go to this Miro section up here in studio and you click run base mode and then uh, a, a basic interface is already up and running. It's as easy as that, right? Now, um, I can solve my model here. I can play around with the data, solve my model and you can see that the outputs are refreshed and uh, I get new data. Uh, so if I were to say, uh, let's say my freight costs here are, uh, I increased to 100. Let's look at the output from before. It was 153. This should increase obviously if I increase my uh, uh, freight cost and you can see that this updated to 170.75. Now, uh, what you see here is the schedule. Obviously, this uh, is not so nice to look at. So what I can do with this, uh, uh, with this pivoting tool here is I can move and visualize the data as I want it to. So for example, I could say I want to filter by my quantities, which are the shipment quantities. And let's say I want to have the markets, I want to pivot the markets, move them to the columns, and let's, uh, let's use a stacked bar chart here, right? And you can see that, okay, now what do I see here? Well, my, uh, my plant San Diego is shipping a total of uh, about 550 units. Uh, almost equally distributed between Topeka and New York or exactly equally distributed. And my plan Seattle is shipping uh, about three or exactly 350 units to uh, a large chunk to Chicago and a smaller chunk to New York. Um, I could ob obviously move these around here. So, uh, oh, sorry. I want to use my markets here and now you see the opposite view right now you see uh, for for each market where do the do the um, cases come from and uh, you can see that Chicago is uh, coming is or all the demand for Chicago is um, coming from Seattle and uh, all the demand for Topeka is coming from San Diego and for New York uh, a large chunk is coming from San Diego and the rest from Seattle so this is how you can uh, already grasp some uh, idea about what your model is doing, right? And if it's doing the right thing or, or if you already see some irregularities here. And I wanna emphasize again, the idea really here is that the focus is on the modeling part. The hard part here was writing this model and coming up with this. Once you've done that part, we wanted to make it as easy as possible to 
go from this model and, and, and deploy a, a, an interactive application. Right. Now, what you've seen so far is the very basic user interface of Miro. We didn't do any sort of configuration, right? The only thing we did was using these annotations inside our model. Miro can do a lot more for you. And to be able to demonstrate that, I wanna launch the so-called Miro configuration mode. Now this configuration mode lets you do all sorts of um, customization to your application. So I can launch this configuration mode here and you can see that a different interface uh, appears. Now I can set my logo here that, that's displayed up, up left. I can uh, change the, the, the symbol configuration. So for example, I can rename my symbols or my headers of my symbols in the tables. Uh, I can reorder my symbols, I can group them and I can do all sorts of stuff here, right? Now, to give you an example, I wanna go to the widgets section now, what we call a widget is a sort of um, um, visual way to input data. Now, the, the most obvious widget that you've already seen is a table, right? These tables that you've seen in the input section, which I changed the 90 to 100 before, is a widget. But there are more. There, there is not just a table in Miro. For example, there is a slider. Uh, there is a drop down menu, there are checkboxes, numeric inputs, date inputs, and so forth. So let's uh, do one example here. Let's use the, the, the fright parameter here uh, and, and let's use a slider for that one. Let's say the minimum value should be zero and the maximum value should be, I don't know, a thousand and the default value should be 90, right? And now I've got a slider here uh, maybe I, I want to show some tick marks underneath so to better visualize um, where my slider is currently at. And now I just save that and now I uh, configured a slider for my symbol fright. Um, and let's do one more thing. Let's also uh, set up a graph, right? So for that, I import some example data here and I say that I want to configure a graph for my symbol schedule, right? I don't want this to be a pie chart, but rather a map. So what you see here is an empty map so far. Let's add some markers to it. Let's say that my longitude uh, should, uh, sorry, my latitude data should come from uh, lat P and the longitude from long P, P for plant. Um, I can give a name to these markers. So these are my plants. And uh, with this notation bracket, I closing bracket, I get uh, to see the names of my, of my markers here. So this is basically saying this should be dynamic, right? And this should come from the column I. If I go to my schedule symbol uh, in studio here, I see that this column I represents my plants. So that, that, that's what I do by this uh, notation here. And let's add another set of markers. Let's say these should be the let M for market and long M for market. Let's say these are my markets and I do the same notation here, but instead of I it's now J because J is the uh, um, symbol for the markets. And now since they look alike, maybe I can restyle the icons here for the, for the plants so that I I'm able to differentiate them a little bit from the markets. Uh, so let's say I want the plus sign here and the marker color should be, I don't know, uh, let's do purple, right? So now I can differentiate the two uh, a little better. Now, the most obvious thing is still missing in this map and that's the flow. So uh, I wanna visualize where my um, um, shipments um, or how my shipments flow. So where do they come from? Where do they go? So I say add flows. Now I need to configure where the flow originates. That's obviously the plant. So let P long P and 
where the flow ends, that's my market. So let M uh, long M. And the data for my flow is the quantities uh, dimension, right? So now I see that I've added some flows. Uh, I don't have a time dimension. You could make this interactive if the flows change over time. Uh, you could add a time dimension to it as well, uh, which I don't have here. Um, but maybe I want to style the flows a little different. Uh, maybe make the make the uh, decrease the maximum thickness a little bit, and also change the color here. Um, I don't know. It's looks pretty ugly, but well, I, I guess you get the idea. Um, and once I'm once I'm happy with this, I can save this, and now my um, configuration has updated. Now I can go back to the base mode. So I close the configuration mode, and I go back to my base mode. I let me row load again, and uh, I go to load data here. Import my default scenario. And uh, you can see that my F, my, my fright cost, is, is, is gone from this scalar table. Instead, it moved to this input widgets tab here. So if I go here, I can see that, oh, now I'm able to adjust the, the, the fright cost by, my, um, by a slider instead of a table. Uh, I can solve this model again. And uh, I can see that also my shipment parameter now switch from the default uh, um, renderer, which was this pivot tool, which I could use to interactively move around my dimensions to, to see exactly what I want to this, to this map here. And uh, the output scalar, we didn't change anything there. That's still the default. Right, so that's how you start to configure your application and to customize it to your needs. Let me go back to the to the slides now. Um, all right. So I guess now you are already pretty fed up with this um, with this transportation model. So in order to uh, bring a little different model into play here and to make things a little more interesting, I decided that the second part of my presentation um, deals with this with a with a different model. This is a model from the financing sector and it's called uh, pick stock. Um, so the basic idea here is that we have um, data in a different, in a, in a given uh, time period of the 30 stocks in the Dow Jones index. And our, our problem here is that we wanna create an index fund with a subset of these 30 stocks and we, de de we define how many of these stocks our model is allowed to pick. And our objective function is that we want this index fund to follow the Dow Jones as closely as possible. So what you see here is we have uh, uh, stock data uh, from the year 2016 here. The red line here is our Dow Jones index. And uh, um, what you see here as, as a shaded uh, kind of area of red and, and blue is the idea that, well, we all know that optimization will do its job optimally, right? Uh, so if we say that we wanna get an index fund with the least uh, uh, amount of deviation between our index fund and the Dow Jones index, it will give us the optimal solution. But what we are really interested in is how well our index fund performs on unknown data, right? Uh, and so in order to kind of simulate that, we divide our data set into a training phase and a testing phase. And we feed the model only with data from the training phase. We let it calculate and find the index fund for the training phase. And then to evaluate our index fund, we use the testing data. And so we split the data set into two parts. We train with the training phase and we evaluate our index fund with the uh, data from the testing phase. What you see here is the algebraic formulation of our model. So we have a slack, uh, a positive slack and a negative slack. So the deviation between our index fund and the, uh, and the Dow Jones index. And we wanna minimize the sum of that. 
Um, and I don't want to go into too much detail here. This one here is basically saying that, okay, we are allowed to pick at, le at most the max stock number of stocks and max stock is a parameter. So that's something we give to the model and uh, a P of S is, is, is our um, variable, the stocks that we, that we pick. Uh, WS is here is the weight of the stocks. Um, uh, I guess the idea is kind of clear. So we want to minimize whatever uh, is in the training data. So we, we, our model should find an index fund that approximates the Dow Jones here as closely as possible by minimizing the absolute deviation as I described. So the, the area between these curves here and uh, we then use the stock that the model came up with to evaluate it on the testing data. So what you see here is the obvious uh, result you would expect. It does very well or optimal in the training phase, but in the testing phase, the data that the model did not know about, uh, you can see that the two curves deviate quite a lot uh, further. Right. And so with that in mind, I want to switch here to my pick stock model. So uh, Stefan described already um, how a typical GAMS model looks like, what the building blocks are. We have sets, we have parameters, uh, and we have variables and equations down here. And these uh, equations here should look familiar to you. That's what I just shown you on the slide. Uh, and, and GAMS allows you to, um, to, to formulate your model with a syntax that is very close to the algebraic formulation that you, that you know as an, uh, as an OR expert, right? Then we set up our model here. Uh, we set some options and we define some uh, parameters for uh, storing the results. And somewhere here should be our solve statement. It's a little hidden here. So this is the, the, the core here. It's, this is instructing GAMS to solve the model pick stock that we set up here, minimizing our objective uh, function variable. And it's a mixed integer problem since we have discrete decisions here, right? Either I pick the stock or not. And the rest here is, is just for collecting the results. Uh, I don't think we need to go into detail here. It's a very uh, standard GAMS model. And if I click on solve here in studio, you can see that uh, it, it, it used the data that, I, uh, that I've assigned here and solved the model for me. Um, now I can run the base mode. This is an app that I've already configured. So uh, when I launch this here, you can see that I've already set up a readme file here where I describe, describe the problem. Um, I have my input widgets where uh, I can say how many stocks the model is allowed to pick at most, right? That's my max stock um, scalar here. Uh, then I have another slider for selecting the number of training days. So I have a fixed amount of, 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 of days. I have 150 able to of my or how much of my data I'm going to use for uh, training the model. And then obviously the rest is used for testing. Here I can also select the solver. That's not as interesting now, I guess. And here is the is the real data of my model. So I have uh, different dates, the stock symbols and the prices. And obviously I'm, I'm, I'm able to modify this here. Now I can switch my view from this table and I can see that, okay, now I have a graphical representation of this. Uh, this is a, a line chart of, of my data. I can interactively play around with that and look at it and grasp it in a, a much nicer way than, than in this tabular form here. And uh, I can then solve my model and load the results. 
And what you see here is uh, very similar to what you've seen before. So I have my training phase, uh, which is this part here, uh, where the model does a very, very good job, obviously. Uh, the, the, the area between these two curves is minimal. And then on the, in the testing part here on the right, I can see that uh, it doesn't look as nice as uh, it does in the, in the training phase anymore. Uh, because that's obviously the data that the model does not know about or did not know about. And so I can also look at this uh, in terms of a histogram. So I can look at the error of the, the, the deviation between my two curves, both for the training phase and the testing phase. Uh, so this is the error in the training phase. And uh, this is the error in the testing phase. Again, what we've already seen here, but in a different form of visualization. Right. Now I can start playing around with this. So let's say I was uh, I were to increase the number of stocks from two to six, uh, and I solve the model again. And the results update, and I can see oh that looks uh, quite a lot better here in the in the testing phase than it did before. And now I can start playing around with this and look at the difference between the two. But what I would really like to do is I would like to compare different runs with each other, right? And so whatever is in the input and output section, all the data I can store in the Miro internal data phase in what we call a scenario. So what I do now is I say scenario, save as, and this is a scenario where I uh, allowed six stocks to select. So I named this scenario six stocks. I click on OK, and you can see that now uh, something happened and Miro saved this um, data, this scenario in the database with the name six stocks. What I would then do is go back to the input section, increase my stocks from six to eight, solve again, Wait for the results. <clears throat> and you can see that uh, maybe it's not as obvious as it was from two to six anymore, which of the two uh, index funds performs better in the testing phase. And so I would like to compare them. So I say again, save as, but this time I allowed eight stocks. So I save this as a scenario eight stocks. And now I go to this compare scenarios section here on the left. So I go here and I say load and I select my two scenarios. I go on import. It's loading the data into the interface. And you can see that a familiar renderer, a familiar visualiz visualization uh, is already here, it's this pivot chart, and I have a dimension scenario now. So if I were to say, I wanna move this um, scenario uh, dimension into the columns, and I would like to only see the index fund, so I move the header to the filter here, and no, I don't want to see the Dow Jones. That's obviously identical for the two scenarios, but I want to see the index fund um, and switch to a line chart here. You can see directly see the difference between the two, right? You can see that this is the index fund of my six stocks scenario, and this is the index fund of my eight stocks scenario. And now let's go to this absolute error here to see which one actually performs better. Let's do the same, switch the scenario index to the columns. Um, and let's first look at the absolute error in the testing phase, right? Let's again, bring up a line chart here. And you can see that the one with six stocks and especially towards the end performed a lot better than the one with eight stocks. If I go to the error in the, in the training phase, uh, the picture is not not as clear here, but that's not really the error we are we are interested in, right? Um, right. Okay, I guess now uh, 
you have a understanding of what a Miro scenario is and what you can do with it. Um, so this is now an app that I've built. I've, I've developed my model. I've uh, uh, come up with, with an interface for my model by annotating it and configuring it using the configuration mode. Now I would like to give it to my end users. And this is what we call deploying a Miro application. So how do I do that? Well, first I need to say that I need a model assembly file. Now a model assembly file is telling Miro what files belong to your model. So what should be packaged in your app, right? Um, now in the most basic case, this could be a single GMS file. So the, 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 the main file that you've seen uh, before where my model formulation is in. However, this file here reads some, some data from this Dow Jones 2016 CSV file. So I need to add that as well. And if I had more files, usually uh, larger GAMS models have lots and lots of include files and maybe some static data that does not come from Miro, but is read from uh, an SQL database or, or an Excel file or whatnot, uh, I would need to include these in order to tell Miro that all of this needs to be packaged. So I say that in this case, I need these two files. I say create. You can see that it, this is just a simple text file uh, that lists all the files that are part of my model. And now I can go to this deploy dialog here. So I click on deploy. You can see that it already picked up my model assembly file here. Uh, I wanna deploy the base mode. I wanna um, deploy this for a multi-user environment. And I click on deploy here. And now what Miro does, it's, it's, it builds a Miro app, a bundle uh, that is self-contained that you can give to your end users so that they can install it and launch your, your app just as you configured it and set it up. So what you see here is that uh, in this log here, it tells you that my Pickstock informs Miro app was successfully deployed to this particular location. So I go to this location and uh, Sorry, oh, sorry, the pick stock, not transport. So let me go to the pick stock here. And here you see that I now have a Miro app, which, um, which was created for me. I can double click this app and now Miro launches, the Miro library launches, and it gives me the option to add this app to my library. So what I do is I click on add app here. It imports this app. And now I have my first uh, Miro app deployed, which I could launch from here. Right, so this is the, the workflow. Um, obviously, this is not a workflow that works for most um, optimization projects. Why not? Well, we, we call this the utopia approach, right? You first develop your model, then you develop your app, you build your app around that, then you deploy it, and then everyone is happy. That's typically not uh, how it works. I mentioned this before. How this usually works is in an iterative fashion. So you develop your model, you come up with your app, uh, your users give you feedback based on the app, you uh, uh, go back to the drawing board, do some changes to your model and, and uh, develop a second prototype. And th then again, you go back to the drawing board and develop a third prototype and so forth un until everyone is happy and your app really makes a difference uh, in, in practice. So, and Miro is really, like designed to help you with this sort of workflow that very early on, just you annotate your model. You don't have to set up any charts or anything for it yet. You, you, you just make some basic uh, model formulation, deploy that, give that to the, to the users of your model. They start playing around with that, with it, give you feedback. Again, you deploy a second prototype. 
they just uh, overwrite the first prototype with the second one, start playing around and so forth. I guess you get the idea. Um, that's typically the approach how Miro should be used in, 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 a, uh, in any optimization project that uh, you want to succeed. And hopefully at some stage you have an app which really the work because it's never really finished, but it's, a, it's, an, it's an app that people work for for a, a certain longer amount of time until they, the, the, the environment changes. So your assumptions are invalidated of your model and you need to uh, make some changes to the model um, and, and, and then you get a new version. Um, it's it's never really finished, but uh, I guess what what this would be like a version 1.0 and then you have a version 2.0 and so forth. Okay, now I've mentioned previously that Miro is a web application, so it runs both on your local machine, but it also runs in any modern web browser. And um, that enables you to deploy a Miro application to a server. Um, this is, so this is the local setup here, GAMS and Miro are installed locally. Uh, and then on the right here, uh, I, I, let me skip the, the middle one uh, for now. On the right here, we have everything installed on a server. So that allows you to collaborate with different people. You can share the data, the scenarios with different people and different people can work on it, make changes, save it again so that uh, some other user uh, picks up on the work that someone else did. And one crucial part here is the execution of your GAMS jobs because that might be very computationally intensive. Uh, Launching and, 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 and operating the web interface also needs some computation, but usually the, the heavy computation is done on the model side on the, when, when, when you have a solve statement. Um, and that computation can also be uh, um, leveraged from a Miro desktop application. So you can have your Miro your, your user interface running on a local uh, machine, but you, you would like to give the, the GAMS jobs to a server that is designed to, to take on the heavy computation. And for this purpose, we've created what we call GAMS engine. So that leads to the last part of today's workshop. I guess um, before I go to that, um, are there any questions for the Miro part? <laughs> 